Hey everyone! Now, I don't know about you, but I like people who shatter my illusions. One thing I like about Slavoj Žižek is his criticism of the left. The question he poses to leftists is, what happens the day after the revolution? He puts it like this. Let me give you a metaphor that I always like to use for this. I hope our viewers have seen a movie, I think, about 10 years ago, it was popular, V for Vendetta. I will not go into the story. The point is that at the end, there is a revolution in England, some imagined England. The crowd breaks the, through the police barrier, penetrates the British Parliament, the people take over, and, and the end of the film. My idea is that Sorry for this vulgar expression, but it expresses precisely how I feel. I would like to see, I would sell my mother into slavery, to see a movie called V for Vendetta Part 2. Okay, guys, people took over. What would they have done a day later? How would they reorganize the power? The same state, how would they restructure the power? It's an important point because that scene is obviously supposed to inspire, and toppling a government is a difficult but necessary step in a revolution. But what's next? I wonder how many people who consider themselves leftists or revolutionaries have even thought about it. So let's talk about it. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. If you don't yet know why a revolution might be desirable, I recommend watching some of the other videos on this channel before you watch this one. It's a bit funny to me to think of that time as the day after the revolution. I see it more as a moment of the revolution, the revolt or uprising. It's kind of the middle. Before the uprising, we need to educate people, to organize, to create alternative forms of governance and new forms of resistance. And afterwards, we can begin to solve the problems we can't tackle under the present system. To me, that whole process is the revolution. People don't just wake up and realize they need to overthrow the state and seize the means of production. They need to understand why those things are preferable solutions to waiting around another few hundred years until the right kind of ruler comes along. Reaching that position takes analysis of their situation. If people aren't involved in the analysis of the conditions they live under, they won't become conscious of the need for revolution, let alone how to carry it out. I always recommend the book uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paolo Freire, because it's basically a program of self-education for self-liberation. We would have spent a considerable amount of time building a movement before that moment of uprising. Any revolution that could possibly happen nowadays, I think, would need to, to act in various places. There isn't just one center of power, after all. Take one place and they'll attack you from another place. Build a decentralized movement with chapters in various places, and it's much harder for them to reverse your progress. The way it happens in V for Vendetta, well, in, in the movie, I, I don't really know the comic, but the way it happens in V is pretty unrealistic, I think, because it, basically, it's just one city. If, if that represents that uprising happening everywhere, then good, then it's successful, it's finished. Let's assume a successful revolt or uprising, so I can keep answering the question. Abolish the institutions of the police, the military, the prison, the courts, and the mental institution. These are all tools of power to maintain social hierarchy. But abolishing them doesn't mean the people who, who operate them have nowhere to go. They'll still have things to do. We'll still need self-defense. We just don't need a single central institution that provides it on its own terms. We'll still need mental health treatment, just not a prison for people who are labeled insane. 
I'm sure we'll need to restrain some people too, but the focus will be on care and reconciliation, not building new prisons. All this will mean new institutions built from the bottom up by people in the field, designed with solidarity rather than punishment in mind. I can't tell you how they'll be designed because it's not my field. I don't have to know what will happen after a revolution. In fact, I can't know. If values like solidarity and critical thinking are widespread, though, the people involved will do what's right. We'd still have to remain vigilant, because since the dawn of mass society, there have been people trying to wield power over others. One priority would be to develop measures to keep each other safe. They would most likely form local and worldwide networks of people trained in self-defense, and ideally that would be everybody who's mentally and physically capable of it. But I think such networks would need to exist in some form for the revolt to have succeeded in the first place. So after the uprising, it would be less a question of forming them and more a question of figuring out together what would be the best way forward. What are the next steps? What's our vision? At any rate, their task would change, but some kind of self-defense or peacekeeping will be necessary for the foreseeable future. Like even after you smash the state and eliminate the threat of fascism, there'll still be sexual predators and abusers of all kinds. I think the way detectives operate could, to an extent, be emulated in a world without police. We'll still need people to examine evidence and put clues together and track down and stop people who are hurting others. At the same time, they'll be using violence, so they'll need to be accountable to the people where they live, and that in itself is a whole structure. We can't have people just going around killing others and then claiming they were pedophiles. But that's just public safety. There'll be plenty more to do. We'll all have work. The difference is, right now, we only do work that's paid rather than work that's necessary. In the revolution, people will have the freedom to do the work they think is important. They might start by discussing their situation and deciding together what needs to be done. They might set up mutual aid arrangements with their friends and neighbors. They might want to start community gardens, libraries, or medical facilities. They could fix the potholes in the roads. They could educate neighborhood kids. You get the idea. I think we should share in the menial tasks. You know, you sweep the floors and I'll do the dishes, and then if you want, tomorrow we'll switch. There will be no more of this relegating the poor to the hardest, dirtiest jobs. No one will be poor, and no one will be defined by their job. Most of the work people to do today is useful. But we'd no longer have jobs and bosses. We would do what work we chose to do and stop doing it when we wanted to rest. I expect over time people would stop believing they had one job and one field they were supposed to spend most of their lives in. I think they'd recognize we're capable of being good at more than one thing. We could, most of us could be teachers, for example. Education would still be necessary, after all, and necessary for everyone, not just kids. I made a whole video on how education could be, a link to which you can find in the description, of course. And with no state to force them to go, and no obligations to the market to learn skills that make money, school can finally transform into education. Again, watch the video if you want details, but for now, Forget about the institution of school and think self-directed learning. I think if the revolt is successful, we can assume workers have seized the means of production or are going to in the absence of the state. Again, this process of waking up and preparing for revolution would have started long before the state falls. The 19th century anarchists suggested a confederation of trade unions would be the force most capable of ending capitalism and for organizing post-capitalism. 
the relevant workers would continue to run the machines and so on, but would spend less time filling out forms and listening to bosses and more time talking about how to automate the process. Today, if something gets automated, the workers lose their jobs and the owners make more money. In the absence of owners, automation would mean more vacation time. Designers would make things more efficient, so no more planned obsolescence, no more using plastic just because it's cheaper, and so on. Producers would also need to figure out how to calculate how much needs to be produced and how to distribute it to everyone. It shouldn't be too difficult. Set up feedback mechanisms to figure out how much was needed last time and how much to produce the next time with minimal waste. I think we should phase out money as soon as possible, and I don't mean replacing it with labor vouchers. I mean we should make everything free and accessible to everyone. As long as we still have money, access to goods and services will still be restricted to those who have it. Eliminating money would work fine among people who agree because those people can start providing their skills or products or services for free to other people who think the same. Zizek makes another point I'd like to address in this same video. This idea of rejecting big state representation mechanism, political parties, state power, and to opt for local democracy, transparent local communities managing their affairs, I also think that we have to drop this last dream. It doesn't work. It's good when it happens, but if nothing else, today's problems are global problems in a much more radical sense. His point about global structures and global issues is easy to overlook. Even after removing the state, we might need global systems of some kind to deal with global issues. Like everything else, it should be as decentralized as possible to prevent a new hierarchy from emerging. So what do we have now? Parliaments or congresses where people who are barely accountable to anyone make decisions for everyone, and whose power ends at an arbitrary line on a map. We don't want a power structure. Most organization would be local, but local organizers would be able to coordinate with other people around the world in some kind of global organization tasked with solving a specific problem. If there's an organization for cleaning up waterways or making alternatives to plastic, there will be plenty of people interested in contributing, and they won't have to get funding or permission from people who assumed the power to grant it. Such organizations wouldn't have hierarchy and might not even have much structure. They'd be horizontally organized associations for sharing knowledge and helping one another. Decisions would still be taken locally, and on occasion, when a bigger decision needed to be made, all the relevant people could be part of it. And no one would be forced into any association, so you can join and leave as you like, even go to a different part of the world. In a way, we've already begun to build these associations, thanks in large part to the internet. We already have non-hierarchical, egalitarian, and decentralized groups for every interest and cause. If we could just get them together to stamp out the state, we'd be free of the fetters of oppressive systems. When you leave people alone, they find ways to do what they need to do. They act in their own interests. What I want is to make people realize being free is possible and in everyone's interest. The short answer to the question, what happens after the revolution, is the people will decide that for themselves. So those are some of my opinions on how the revolution could look. Zizek asks a great question, and I find leftists differ mainly in their answers to that question. But I certainly think we can work together, at least until the current system is eliminated, creating the means of revolution through local organization, global coordination, and solidarity with everyone in the same boat around the world. Thanks.